Oh, hey, YouTube. How the bloody fucking heck are ya? And welcome to the fucking booty base. In today's video, we are going to be explaining and exploring through two of the most loved and famous exercises in all of the fitness industry and discussing which is best for the glutes, hip thrusts or squats. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not really going to be telling you which exercise is best because they're both absolutely fucking incredible for your glute gains. However, they are both extremely different exercises in the way that they challenge our body. And we're going to be breaking down exactly how they are different in these seven different categories to help you better understand both of the exercises and how you can effectively program them into your training so you can plump your rump, perk your peach, and build your booty. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get into it. The first difference that we need to discuss with squats and hip thrusts is what we call the load vector. You see, human movement only really goes through a few different planes of movement which we can define as our load vectors and they are the complete opposite when it comes to our squats versus our hip thrusts. You see, a squat is what we call a vertical or axial loaded movement. Now, what that means is when we have that barbell up on our back, it's challenging our body in an up and down direction and that weight is going directly down through our body. However, when we do a hip thrust, we load the barbell up onto our hips, and now, instead of the weight challenging us in an up and down fashion, it's cutting our body in half and challenging us to keep our body up in this direction rather than up in that direction. The second topic that we need to discuss in the differences between squats and hip thrusts is what we call the strength curve or the resistance profile of the lift. You see, with a squat, you can stand up with a barbell on your back and sure, it might be feeling a little heavy, but it's really not challenging you all that much. And it's not until you start to come back and down, 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 deep into the bottom of your ramp that you're really starting to actually challenge the muscles and challenge the movement. So, with a squat, we, it's easiest at the top, however, it's hardest at the bottom. But with a hip thrust down at the bottom of our rep, well, again, we're kind of just resting there and we can actually gain a little bit of momentum from the bottom because it's easier for us at the bottom of the lift. However, as we come up and raise our hips all the way up to the top and we squeeze for dear life, it is really, really hard to hold and achieve that lockout position. So with a hip thrust, it's easier at the bottom and hardest at the top. Now, our next topic of discussion is where our movements are training in regards to their muscle length and the mind-muscle connection that we're getting with both our squats and our hip thrusts. Now, as I just mentioned, at a squat, we are really not getting much at the top of the movement when our glutes are in a shortened position. However, as we get lower and lower and lower into the rep, as the rep gets harder and harder, our glutes have to come stretched to be able to get down into that deep hip flexion. So, squats are much better at training the glutes down deep below parallel to make sure that we're getting that really good stretch onto the glutes. But, with our hip thrusts, it's the exact opposite. With our hip thrusts, at the bottom of the movement it's easier, and as we come all the way up into a squeezed and shortened position, that is where the glutes are getting challenged the most. Now, this can affect us in a lot of different ways, but one thing that it definitely will affect is how much you actually feel either of these movements in your glutes. You see, a lot of people always send me DMs being like, I can't feel my, my, uh, my glutes when I'm squatting. And that's completely normal. Some people will get a little bit of a mind-muscle connection to the glutes, but it's a lot harder to feel a muscle when it's in a stretched position versus when it's in a squeezed position. Now, if you've performed hip thrusts, and in particular, hip thrusts with three second holds or high rep hip thrusts, you know that it's almost impossible to not feel your glutes, and that's because they're maximally contracted in that peak contraction in the shortened position. 
I like to give this example of somebody feeling a bicep curl. If you were to just relax your arm down here and your bicep was in a lengthened position and you said squeeze your bicep as hard as you can, you can do it, but you're not really gonna feel the bicep all that much. But if you then come up and shorten the muscle and squeeze, then all of a sudden that bicep lights up and fires like crazy. Now, don't get me wrong, that does not mean in any way at all that squats aren't good just because you can't feel the muscle squeezing. That's not what tension's about. It's not always about the mind-muscle connection. However, it definitely is a, diff a difference that's worth discussing because it's important to know which exercises you should be feeling in particular ranges of motion and at particular lengths of the muscle uh, in regards to the actual movement that you are performing. All right, all right, all right. So moving on to topic of discussion number four, because you see both these exercises train the glutes, but they also do just a little bit more. So we're gonna be discussing the muscle recruitment that's involved with both of the lifts. You see, squats are a fucking big movement and they target a lot of muscle groups to be able to contribute towards you being able to perform the movement effectively. Yes, squats are great for your glutes, but they also absolutely hammer the quads. They absolutely trash the adductors if you're squatting down low. They take a tremendous amount of core stability, of upper back strength and stability, and, and even mobility to be able to actually perform the lift effectively and to be able to progressively overload. So we're recruiting a hell of a lot more than just our glutes with a squat. And also, when we are talking about the glutes, the muscle recruitment within the subdivisions of the glutes as to whether it's targeting a little bit more upper glute or a little bit lower glute, the, a, a squat will definitely be recruiting a lot more lower glutes, however, probably not doing as much for the upper glutes in relation to our hip thrusts. Now, hip thrusts, they definitely do work a little bit of quads, they definitely do involve some of the hamstrings, however, it's primarily a glute-focused lift. It's still a big compound movement, it still requires a lot of energy to perform, but the glutes are really the main attraction when it comes to hip thrusts. And when it comes to our subdivisions of the glutes, well, hip thrusts really do a pretty good job at, at targeting the entire glute max, but they probably do a little bit more for the upper glutes, or they definitely do a lot more for the upper glutes than squats do. So glutes for hip thrust is a little bit more of a well-rounded approach, which doesn't really require too much assistance from other muscle groups coming into play. However, squats are a big total body movement. Well, they're a lower body movement, but really it requires a lot of total body strength and mobility to be able to go through the exercise effectively. Now, our next topic of discussion has less to do with what happens when we actually perform the movement and more to do with what happens afterwards because we can't talk about an exercise without talking about our ability to recover from that exercise. You see, squats are absolutely fucking incredible for a lot of reasons. And some of the ones that I'm gonna mention, we have already touched on. You see, squats recruit a lot of different muscles and they are really big taxing lift for us to perform because it's a really big lower body, but also kind of a total body movement to be able to actually perform them and perform them well. Now, that means that they are pretty taxing and that means that our recovery time is probably a little bit longer purely just because we're putting so much effort into such a big lift that requires so much energy. But it's a lot more than just the other muscles recruited because I'm the glute guru and I'm here to talk mostly about the glutes. So we have to also look at the range of motion and the eccentric contraction and what that does in relation to the muscle damage that we get that we need to recover from. Now, muscle damage is also known as DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. 
And because squats are such a fucking incredible exercise, and for those of you who can squat down nice and low, you get to take your squats through a really big range of motion, or rather take your glutes through a really big range of motion as you come down deep into hip flexion, and you get all the way down and get that big stretch onto the muscle. But if you've got heavy weight up on your shoulder, that means you need to eccentrically control that weight the whole way down through that big stretch onto the glutes. Now, eccentric contractions and making sure that we're really controlling and getting down deep into a length of position is one of the main contributing factors to what happens when we experience that muscle damage or that muscle soreness a few days after we train. So even though when you're doing your squats, you might not really feel your glutes working all that much, and you might be wondering what the bloody heck's going on here. I thought squats were supposed to be great for my glutes, but then a day or two later, you wake up grabbing your ass and you can barely fucking sit on the toilet to go and do a poop because your glutes are so sore. Now, again, that's not in any way a bad thing, and we also do want to be able to you know, make sure we do get a little sore from our training to make sure we know that we trained effectively, but we don't want to be debilitatingly sore all the time. So we need to factor in our recovery for when we are actually picking and selecting our exercises. But inversely, when we look at a hip thrust, you'll see that one, we're not really recruiting anywhere near as, as many muscles as the big movement with our squats. Two, the range of motion is nowhere near as big as it is with a squat, particularly a deep squat. And three, we're not training the muscle in its length and position. We're training it up and getting a lot of peak activation on our squeeze at the top of our rep. And then when we lower it down, well, we're not really eccentrically contracting all that hard. Yeah, a little bit, but not a hell of a lot. So we're gonna be getting a lot of peak activation at the top of our hip thrust, and this is fantastic because tension on the glutes in peak activation is what we really need to be able to stimulate muscle growth so we can perform it, we can progressively overload it, and we don't really get all that sore from our hip thrusts. A lot of people, when they come down here and train at the booty base, they do their hip thrust, the glutes are burning, they're squeezing, and they're thinking, holy fuck shit, I'm gonna be so sore over the next few days. But then they realize that, oh, I'm actually not too sore from that workout. But if I gave them three or four sets of heavy squats, some heavy lunges, or whatever else it might be, the next few days, they come back to me and they say, what the bloody fucking heck happened? Why are my glutes so sore? And it's important to be able to factor in our recovery when it comes to our training. And yes, definitely we can progressively overload our squats. Yes, definitely we get a lot of peak activation on the stretch, but it affects our muscle damage differently because of the bigger eccentric contraction and the way that we're actually targeting the muscle at different muscle lengths in regards to our recovery. Our next topic of discussion really ties in quite well with our last topic because we just spoke about how long it takes to recover from both of the, these exercises. So what we're discussing next is how frequently should we or can we perform these exercises in a well-rounded program? Well, we know that squats are quite taxing and they are gonna be making us a little bit sore and creating a little bit more muscle damage. So it would probably make a lot of sense if we didn't go and do really big heavy squats and perform them three or four times a week because we would constantly be sore and constantly be having to try to recover from this exercise and very likely taxing our body a little bit too much than what it might be able to handle because of the way uh, that squats actually affect our body. However, with our hip thrusts, it's a little bit of a different story. I like to promote girls to be able to hip thrust usually three times per week. And a lot of the girls down here at the booty base do that and they do that very, very effectively. And we tie that in to be able to program well with the squats as well. So we get to train the muscle in both its lengthened position and its shortened position and also factor in the recovery time that it takes for both of those exercises to be able to make sure that we are getting stronger without just getting sore and running our bodies into the ground. So squats, it's probably best to perform them once or maybe twice a week, 
Maybe if you're doing a squat specialization program, you can maybe get them in three times per week, but you have to be a little bit careful with the squat variations in which you're picking in regards to how well you're actually gonna be recovering from those movements. However, with hip thrusts, you can hip thrust probably anywhere between two to four times per week, recover really well, and also be able to progressively overload this movement over time. So yes, we get a lot of tension in our squats, but we can't do it as frequently as we can with our hip thrust, which we also get a lot of tension on. We can also progressively overload and train them a little bit more frequently. Now, again, that doesn't make either of them better or worse. It just means it's something we need to consider when we write intelligent programming to make sure we are getting the best results possible without running ourselves into the ground. And last but not least, our last topic of discussion is going to be our rep ranges, which are likely most ideal for both squats and hip thrusts. Now, for our squats, they're probably better suited to a lower rep range where we're focusing more on our strength or even a mid rep range where we're still focusing on our strength, but just training in a little bit of a higher rep range. So anywhere between probably one to six reps for our low rep range, anywhere between seven up to maybe 15 reps for our mid rep range. However, when you start climbing up and you start doing a lot of high rep squats, well, it definitely can be a tactic which you can use every now and then, and I actually personally really, really love doing high rep squats, 20, 25, 30 reps, but I can tell you right now, they leave me absolutely fucked because they are so incredibly taxing and a squat requires a lot more skill and stability from all of our other muscles to be able to support us through that movement. So it's very likely that when we start working in those higher rep ranges, our technique starts to go out the window and we can compromise ourselves and maybe lead ourselves into the ground and maybe even get an injury. So a lower rep range or mid rep range is probably best suited for our squats, however, this is mostly a discussion around barbell squats or barbell hip thrusts. If you have access to machine squats, then I like to say it's the complete opposite. And personally, if you have access to a hack squat or a belt squat or some epic machine that's at your gym, then I encourage you to try and do some high rep squats to a failure around that 20 or 30 rep range. And it is next level crazy, okay, with the burn that you'll be getting in your quads but, 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 we don't have to worry about all the other demands of our technique and other muscle groups coming into play. So you can squat in high rep ranges, both with a barbell, yes, but very taxing. And if you are gonna do it, probably a smarter idea to try doing it on a machine. But with our hip thrusts, it's the complete opposite. To be honest with you, I definitely don't discourage hip thrusting in a low rep range, and you definitely can and definitely should if you enjoy it. However, a mid to high rep range is probably best for the hip thrusts. So anywhere between one to six reps for our low rep range, anywhere between about seven all the way up to 15 for our mid rep range, but you can do hip thrust for 20, 30, even do a hip thrust or glute bridge or even body weight hip thrust variation for anywhere up to 50 reps and get an absolutely incredible burn in your glutes. Doesn't matter really what rep range you work in, as long as you can keep your technique and work that muscle close to failure, then it's going to be an effective rep range for you to work in. However, it's a lot better for us to be able to do that with hip thrust because it's far less likely that our technique is going to flaw, so we can perform in those higher rep ranges, get that incredible glute burn that we all know and love, and we don't really have to worry about that risk of injury, and there are a plethora of different hip thrust variations. Again, this video is mostly about barbell squats versus barbell hip thrust, but there's so many hip thrust variations, single leg hip thrust, machine hip thrust, banded hip thrusts and a whole other variety of other ones that I'm not gonna mention because Brittany's looking at me and she's already given me the finger to say that I'm rambling on too long but you guys get the drift I'm sure by now alrighty ladies and gentlemen there you have it that is a wrap for our squats versus hip thrusts I probably could have rambled on about a whole bunch of other topics but I thought I would just Keep it at seven for now, and that's enough for you, for you ladies to be able to learn from, I hope. Now, again, 
There was probably a lot of times in here where I was kind of sounding like I was saying squats aren't all that great. To be honest with you, I'm the glute guru. Hip thrusts are incredible for your glutes, but personally, I prefer squats. Squats are actually probably my favorite exercise. So please don't think that this is a comparison in any way at all to say which exercise is better or best. They are, as you can fucking see, very, very, very different. And people need to stop looking for the best variation of something. And they need to start exploring, they need to start educating, they need to start understanding human movement, not just on a whiteboard or from listening to me, but by going out there and fucking doing it. So, I encourage you, after now having all of this information, to go and implement it with your training so you can create a well-rounded program with both squats and glute, so it's both squats and hip thrusts because you need both to be able to create that incredibly well-rounded, peachy, perky, plump romp that we all know and love. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you enjoyed this video. We have a lot more YouTube content coming your way. It's been amazing to see a lot of you guys subscribing. My subscribers have gone through the roof lately. We're getting a lot more video views. So, let me know in the comments below, what else do you want to see and what do you want me to fucking teach you about? What do you want to see? Tell me, YouTube, because I want to know. And while you're down there, <laughs> If you've made it this goddamn long, well, you might as well do me another favor because I want you to stick around for all the amazing new content we're gonna have. So you're gonna need to go and like, comment, subscribe, turn on the motherfucking notification bell. And ladies and gentlemen, you know what they say. YouTube! Go, go, go.